Hi, Claudia. Hey there. How are you? Good. I can see some really lovely people there. Hey, guys. Welcome to the very first session of our Plugged In series by the Adelaide Project. A series of conversations focused on bringing inspiration to the creative community. I am your host, Clarissa Llanesa, interior and lighting designer, creative director, and certified oversharer. Every few weeks, I will be sitting down with creatives to talk about their experiences, what excites them, what makes them tick, uncovering the curiosities and dissecting the dynamic path that led them to where they are today. This week, I am excited to welcome Claudia Kappel Joy, co founder, creative, and managing director of Concept Lighting Lab, an energetic and motivated team of lighting designers and architects based in Tucson, Arizona. Originally from Austria, Claudia is a world traveler, a passionate and compassionate designer, and an all around beautiful human being. We first met at a Congress in Venice in July of 2011. What struck me first about Claudia and has proven to be more and more true with each time our paths have crossed is her humility, kindness, and warmth. Conversations with Claudia are always deep, fascinating, and inspiring, which is why I am truly honored to have her here with us today. Claudia, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> So um, even though I provided everyone with a little bit um, of information of a small intro um, about you, but we want to learn more about you, you know, where you come from, how you got here. So in your own words, could you please describe yourself a little bit and, you know, who you are and what do you do for those of you that don't really know? <laughs> um, so um, I'm Claudia. I am Austrian, so Central European, and I have grown up in the Austrian valleys and countryside. Um, Clarissa actually asked me to share some images uh, while uh, talking, and so I thought I might just share with you some of the images of my home. This is pretty much my home valley. I'm from the southern region of Austria called Kärnten, surrounded by mountains, um, deep valleys that are all interconnected. And my hometown, Spital, is the third biggest kind of district in all Austria, but it really interconnects these valleys. We are strongly connected to the mountains. We have full seasons uh, with full bloom. Um, full winter, a lot of snow, a lot of skiing. We also have the amazing lakes and freshwater um, lakes that allow us to be around water a lot and spend a lot of time uh, in the environments. And um, because it is a small region or smaller um, kind of rural region, you usually have the tendency to move out. And so I moved to Graz in order to uh, take my studies in architecture. Graz is a really fantastic, um, also small town compared to other places. It's about 230,000 pe 230, people, big university town. What's really exciting about Graz is it has a very strong historic core and it kind of, the juxtaposition of historic and contemporary building is very informative throughout. And then um, after some while in London, um, I found myself in Sweden, which was probably my biggest formative influence in my becoming um, of the person I'm now. And uh, this is one of the images of Stockholm in the peak of summer. And um, this is one of these very atmospheric images that captures Stockholm um, pretty much in, in the aspect of how I relate to Stockholm. And then this is an image of my current home, which is the desert of the Southwest 
So the Sonoran Desert is, has become my home ground. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I would imagine that just the different environments already give away how influential they were in my becoming as a young professional, or maybe not so young anymore. But um, yeah, I am a lighting designer. I am an architect and space maker. And I've practiced in the field for the last 15 plus years and have had the chance to work with amazing talents who have joined me in my endeavor of Concept Lighting Lab, which is, um, is the studio that I'm leading for the last six years. Um, but also I've been collaborating with amazing inspirations along the way. Uh, one of them, Kai, who we've mentioned earlier. So um, I guess I give it back to you, Clarissa. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly kind of what I wanted to see, mainly the contrast of um, where you grew up and to where you, where you are today, which for me, it's just fascinating. Like, kind of like I'm Dominican from an island and I'm in Toronto, which is the complete difference, you know, um, with weather and, and culture and everything. But um, how did you figure out at, at what age or how did you figure out you wanted to become an architect? You mentioned you are an architect. Um, did it start from a very young age? Um, did you, when did you start realizing that you had a little bit of a, a design streak um, in you? Well, I mean, it's a really good question and it's hard to answer. Um, I should say that my, um, I didn't, it, it didn't, it wasn't really this defined destiny is like, I have to become an architect, like some young people nowadays know very distinctly what their calling is. I haven't had that. It was more something that revealed itself over time by um, finding a way towards um, atmosphere and space making and the emotional aspect that comes with it. And architecture is just this all encompassing um, practice that involves so many aspects from building technology, um, physical reality, and, and all the in-between. And it takes the people, um, or it is for the people. So it, it has been a really um, interesting path to find my way towards architecture rather than deciding wanting to become an architect or a space maker for that matter. And lighting design in that is, um, is another distinct specialty within space making. Um, and while a lot of my friends and people in my surrounding through conversations and continuous exchanges have, have told me, oh yeah, no, that was, that made sense that you've become a lighting designer. It wasn't very apparent to me at first. It was more something that came through the search for space making. And then I should say, um, it sure informed somewhat through my, my uh, immediate family and exposure. My, my uncle is a very passionate uh, builder. And so we have always put hands on and built during summer times and vacation times. Uh, my father was an engineer, so there was a lot of um, maintenance work and technicalities that we always were involved with. And my mother is very culturally um, interested, and so a lot of history and culture made its way into that. So all these aspects, I would imagine, informed uh, my interest in, in the built environment. Um, yeah. So you went into do architecture, and um, I know I I mean I'm obs I, I love your thesis. Um, so do you you obviously after your architecture studies or during your architectural studies you you did your thesis, which had a lot to do with lighting. I I, I think so. Do you do you think that had a little bit to do with um, the way that you yeah. approached that with you becoming a lighting designer? I mean. Um, so I, I attended architecture school in Graz, um, like attempted to finish with a master degree in architecture. Um, 
the degree in Graz is very interesting because um, you you have an, you have this juxtaposition of influences, history, highly contemporary architecture that juxtaposes um, the historic build. So there's no fake new architecture, but there's this interesting tension and dialogue of the old and new. And so when I um, went through my studies, there was a lot of exposure of real public realm that you constantly bounced your studies off with. And there was a lot of dialogue and exchange. I had the, I was very fortunate that um, one of my best friends, Hani and I, we were accepted into one of these drawing studios, which were this um, very heavily um, gated creative grounds. Um, we worked within those studios and there was a strong studio culture. And because of it, we were exposed to more mature thinkers, uh, very conceptual thinkers, which was really a huge education for us besides the actual curriculum. Um, I also knew that um, travel and outside influences would be really important for me to mature. And so I traveled a lot and um, attended conferences and different uh, details. One of the, one of the uh, big influences was that I, um, I managed to get an internship at Claudia Silvestrin's studio. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Who was at that, at that time was a, a real icon for me. I really appreciated the work beyond belief. And so I applied at the studio and I was accepted. Uh, one of the reasons was that he at that time had built a fashion store and an amazing restaurant in Graz, so we knew about his work. He um, worked out of London, so I got that internship. And during the phases, being in London, going to exhibitions, reading books, being exposed to text and discourse and other things, I stumbled on my thesis topic of whiteness. So whiteness wasn't necessarily um, about light at first, um, I realized through my study how important light was and how I was truly interested in atmospheric space making and that lighting was the most crucial, or not the most, but it was this hugely influential uh, tool and medium and unless you know how to work with it, it would be really difficult to create atmosphere. And so to show a little bit about what um, what that means. So again, I mean, this is one of the quotes that's probably really important in the sense of atmosphere becomes the setting for experience because it's this all encompassing uh, in between of space. It takes the user into account. It takes all the aspects of um, your know, built environment into account and you can't isolate one out of the other. And uh, one of the other really important influences was uh, um, Yuhani Palasma, a Finnish uh, architect and theoretician who wrote about snow the way I felt about snow. And so one of these things that really drove my interest in working with the theme of whiteness that then was articulated through the medium of snow because it's inherently white. It's not an application of white or it's not a layering of white that then becomes white. It is inherently white as a material and it can be structure and it has all these other qualities. So he, one of the quotes that really inspired me when I came across it and it just like was this uh, epiphany uh, where he writes, snow is a material of inherent dualities. It is uh, inviting and hostile, transient and impermanent yet moldable. It protects against cold but radiates cool coldness. It absorbs sound and emanates light. And snow suppresses shape and materiality and turns the landscape into a dream image. And that was kind of partially the inspiration for my thesis project that then uh, articulated itself through that search of another influential um, writer that I came across uh, who really 
triggered me understanding that you have to earn it. You have to really involve yourself actively in making space and forming space. And that became um, my thesis project, which articulated itself in a white experience um, at a room at Ice Hotel that pretty much had smoothened edge, edges and the main point was in order for you to question some inherent aspects of how we read space because usually we orient ourselves through depth of field we orient ourselves through gravity through horizon we our perspective understanding is through depth of field and distance and if you smooth the edges or you round your surrounding um, and the surface quality is very homogeneous all these aspects of spatial orientations get lost and that experience of the white room that i managed to realize at isotel became that uh, moment you really um, had a whiteout, you couldn't really understand how far is the room, how deep is the room, you needed to take your hands and kind of feel your way a little bit. You knew where you were standing because you had gravity and ground, but if you were laying on the floating um, mattress, the main other reference in the room was the vault, and the vault was only articulated through a senior light source, which we can see here. It was located at the head end of the bed, and it, um, it really uh, created that kind of spatial frame, framework. I personally just, I love that image, and I, I love that you have feelings for snow. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know that it's it's something that you that you love and find beautiful and identify with. You know, I feel that one of the the things that I I really admire about you the most is, is that is the sensitivity towards you know things how you notice some things that a lot of us sometimes take for granted. So, um, so so yes, yeah, I mean what what's what was really exciting and what I didn't quite understand until. This, the space was done and after working with that surface for many weeks is that snow, the insulating quality of snow is not just isolating you from the cold, but it also is absolutely sound absorbent. And because of that, um, you, you are thrown back onto yourself. So um, you hear your heartbeat, you see your breath, so it's very elemental. It's really grounding you in, in the very human elemental, I don't know, pre, pre, being present. And you can't quite take yourself out of it, which makes that environment such an incredibly um, revealing experience. Because I think you have very few other environments where that is happening to this extent. So. I think that's one, maybe one of the attractions of Isotel, I'm not sure, uh, but it's definitely um, had a huge impact on my, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a strong influence and, and lasting impact on how, how I remember it, and it has a deep emotional uh, grounding for me, so. So from, from that and the snow and the ice hotel, now you're in the complete opposite, the desert in Arizona, which when I went actually to the desert and I um, went to the um, Antelope Canyon, I, that was probably the, the most of that feeling I felt where I felt grounded and, and just so small in this world and, and like respectful of just, you know, earth. Mm -hmm. um, so, to that extent, how like how, how did you get to the desert? I know that obviously you um, you met Rick, your husband, through work, and did like how did you end up in Tucson, Arizona? <laughs> right. Well, the reason why I moved to the to the desert um, for everyone who is listening in and might not know me personally is I followed my heart. Um, I met my now husband. Um, 
during my time in Sweden and uh, we got to know each other through work um, and there are many other details to the story that don't need to be discussed here <laughs> but basically um, to cut it short uh, I followed Rick to the desert who who has made the desert his home because he's actually from the northeast he is from Maine originally and he found himself here uh, because he wanted to study architecture and um, I have to say at first I was a little skeptical how I will be doing in the desert because it is so hot and I have always considered myself being a winter person loving snow loving the cold and loving the aspects that come with that and the lifestyle of it um, and then finding yourself in pretty much the opposite extreme in the desert which is very dry um, it is claimed that the desert has no season or some people say like it has 12 seasons depending on how you, how how subtle your observations are i'm more with uh, the people who believe that there are 12 seasons because they're an amazing array of bloom cycles after the rains and um i still have my negotiation with the heat uh, <laughs> which is just last week started to be back to 100 degrees uh, so that is that is every year a little bit of a challenge, but it's it's an incredible environment and the intensity of light and it, it's just so there is there is a quality to the desert that doesn't allow you to get away you really need to respond to it and it puts you into place quite frankly it makes you sometimes feel very very small and it's very humbling um it it also is that you it's also very rewarding to engage with that environment i mean you see how the the plants naturally become very gnarly and, and there's a resilience that's there that has its own beauty and its own expressions to withstand the weather and the, the harshness of the climate. Um, it's also very interesting um, having moved pretty much directly from Sweden to the Southwest. It is very opposite in terms of lighting because in Sweden, you, you seek the light wherever you can get it. You really follow the sun, whereas in the desert, you always seek the shade. And um, so when it comes to the lighting conversation itself and the very crisp um, daylight that we deal with and very harsh and contrasting realities, that we have and I mean I can see Matt here still listening in um, he can probably attest to that as being a, a very great photographer and architect himself um, it, it's really it's quite unforgiving too and the yeah shade is an important one so sometimes talking in the desert about lighting or lighting design is actually really discussing shade or how to mitigate the intensity of light and how to balance it but yeah so i don't know i, mean, actually, I might have digressed here no no, no. i really think that actually it's perfect because it brings me to my next question which you know we've noticed that you work a lot with in understanding daylighting um it seems to me that you work with it prior to considering electrical lighting. I mean, I, I'm not sure if that's the case. Can you expand on that? I mean, you just spoke about the, the harshness of the light in the desert. In a lot of your projects, I see how you, you focus on certain elements and, and, and it feels very much like the emotional aspect of lighting design is also touching a little bit on, on, on the lighting design in general of your projects. And, and what I love is that your thesis, how it just that, that pain of light, that, that sheet and just that basically lighting that back panel that makes everything just look kind of like infinite and the way that you play with lighting and shadows and, and highlighting certain walls um, versus not is, 
amazing for me. So can you expand a little bit on that, on how? Well, know? I mean, I think what's really incredible with lighting as a, as a tool, it's, it's one of these, mediums that really manages to move you emotionally, not just physically, you can direct hierarchically through a room and it draws your attention. So you can, you can set hierarchies and you can move a person because of the way you're lighting um, a space. But what, what, when it comes to the lighting design, the, the way we like to do it at the studio and the way I like to approach it is, is it's a storytelling, but it's also trying to capture you emotionally and, and with your mood. And if you were consistently lighting something, I don't know, um, very evenly and with no hierarchical difference, it would become very bland. Yeah. And um, we, we like to draw attention to specific areas and uh, distinctly we like to light life rather than architecture. So probably one of the big differences towards other colleagues who are experts in facade lighting or experts in really truly articulating an, a form, we are very interested in lighting the occasion or lighting the space that makes you gather or make you kind of come um, sit around a table and that is uh, why there are kind of these these different intensities in the spaces that you might see in in the lighting designs that we create and um, that allows us to introduce different hierarchies and with it just different uh, scenarios or scenes within within the home, the home environment. I should say that that's obviously um, very strongly looked at from a from a residential perspective mm -hmm. but even when it comes to small commercial or boutique environments we like to draw attention to specific areas and then allow pause. It's nearly like a, a music like really good music allows for a pause and allows for you to have a little bit of a rest and then draw your attention to something else and so catch your breath we are interested in that in in those rhythms of um, yeah. lighting and pulse okay well i i i really do believe in can contrast you can notice something if there's no contrast right so catching your breath and lighting and architecture and, and art in life in general especially now how we are today that I feel like we're, we've all had to stop a little bit and, and catch a breath, which, um, you know, um, brings me a little bit to probably one of my next questions, um, which is now that we're all quarantined, um, how do you think this is, you know, going to affect the design community moving forward? I mean, when I was chatting with you recently, and we were talking about how life experiences shape us and make us who we are today. You mentioned um, that um, we have to allow experiences to spin you into different directions and allowing it to shape you is I think what you've definitely done. And from what I can see, it is something that I believe is, you know, admirable. Um, you really do take the experiences and, 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 and your surroundings and, and, and that's what's molded you into who you are today. So with that, how do you think, first of all, two separate questions, that from where you started to now, lighting design in general has evolved and how do you see it moving forward, not just prior COVID, but also now with COVID and, and you know, how do you think it will affect the general design community um, and how do you see yourself in the next few years? It's like a load of questions, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Wow, where to start? <laughs> um, okay, so when I um, when I found my way into lighting, I should say that I or or maybe I can I can retract back a little bit. So when I finished my studies in architecture in Graz with this project of the whiteness and the thesis, which also touches on many aspects that I hadn't been aware of or what it means. Um, from power structures and, and 
um, additional aspects that have to do with how history uh, worked with the medium of white, of whitewashing things and so on. But not to go deeper into it, it brought me, it, it taught me an understanding that I didn't know anything about light and in order to atmospheric, to, to do atmospheric space, I needed to learn about it. And that brought me to Sweden and to um, the education at KTH, uh, where I um, finished with another master in lighting design, but then I had no idea of how to actually work with a medium. And I should say that the main education in lighting uh, was truly the, the opportunity to work at Use Architecture, the studio that Kai Pippo and Niklas Oedman had uh, established, which in the meantime has merged with um, OF lighting. And um, the work in the field truly taught me much more because the education itself was much more scratching on the surface, making you aware of um, aspects, but the, and, and really importantly, holistic thinking about lighting. But it was then the application within Kai's office or within use architecture that made me understand um, kind of the, the, the intricate details that go into collaboration and technical outfitting using electric lighting in balance with daylighting and then um, working in collaboration to make space. Uh, that was more than 15 years ago and since so much has changed so technologically lighting has absolutely transformed itself uh, when i moved to the united states where there's a very different culture towards lighting than let's say in sweden um, you're, you're working much more remotely you don't have the same networks you you have a very different way of how lighting would actually be practiced um, and then on top of everything else, LED started to, to really become market ready. And they have changed the whole way of addressing lighting design. So, so that's part of the answer here. The, the big advancements in technology, even in building technology, um, a whole new development of how lighting is controlled nowadays that is very often not part of the conversation and needs to be part of the conversation because it's so crucial. Who is controlling it? How is it controlled? How is it compatible with other systems? And so on. So that formed its other whole side of things. And then I should say just in principle, besides the environment and and climatically different environments, uh, there are very different cultures in living and in how you even approach to think or approach a conversation in lighting. So I would say that the European context, um, there are, or, and maybe I shouldn't generalize because it is <laughs> different to if you find yourself in the Northeast than finding yourself in the Southwest. But uh, when I started practicing here, I, I very often found myself in environments that had very few light sources and the singular light source was over lighting and was overreaching and had been glary and had pretty much all the aspects that you should try to avoid. Whereas the European side always tried to break out an area into smaller individual fixture densities and then you could have the flexibility to modulate within those densities and create um, ambience through that. And it gives you, it, it, these are very different environments that you would experience. Um, so that's maybe another answer to you. <laughs> And then how COVID-19, I mean, how COVID is influencing practice. Man, that's a, that's a very difficult one. And I can only, I can only guess. I, um, I can only guess that it, it has influences on, um, 
you know, production and market, even trading and, you know, how, how may perhaps if there might be one benefit of it is kind of with all of us now, or most of us working from home and, and kind of being more in a local environment, perhaps we learn to focus back on being more local and not so much reaching far beyond. Um, perhaps the other, the other real opportunity I see with COVID-19 is that it opens up means of working and collaboration. So it makes us a bit more open to not insist on working in the same room, but perhaps um, be a little bit more open in the actual exchange, maybe virtually rather than physically. But on the other hand, we have done this before. So, I mean, we, I'm, we are teaching a lighting course at the university. And when we had to transition six weeks ago towards virtual teaching or remote teaching, the students at first were really overwhelmed. And we kept telling them, you know, we have, we have projects that took one and a half years. We met the clients on two occasions for one hour. And otherwise, everything is happening virtually and online. So that's a reality that you're diving into and you're kind of starting to learn to communicate in different ways and through different means. Um, yeah, and also the world is so global nowadays that, I mean, we're all going to learn, hopefully, a few positive things should come out from this, you know, learning to communicate better. <laughs> um, but with that, I want to make sure that um, people manage to ask some questions because I know um, there's probably a few, but I want to ask you one last question and you mm -hmm. just, you can answer it very, you know, if you were not a lighting designer, what do you think you'd be? I'm, not sure. Um, I'm really fast. I mean, I'm really f fascinated with all the aspects that lighting touches. Um, I'm also very fascinated with the human brain. And um, a lot of people or a lot of family members have actually been in the medical field. I mean, like being dentists and doctors. And so I should say my father was very disappointed when I attempted to go towards architecture rather than medicine. He thought I'd be for a good doctor. I'm not sure about that. Or I, I'm, I'm very happy with my choice. But yeah, I mean, you, you affect people in many in more ways than we can count on with lighting. It is kind of like, you know, you play with their brains, you play with your emotions, you play with their way of living. So... In a way, you are a little bit of a doctor too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm like maybe more a psychologist when it comes psychologist. to psychologist. When it comes to dealing with projects and um, maintaining relationships, that's maybe some something that we all have to do. But um, the and maybe that touches a little bit on the previous question too. What what I what I truly believe in that some of the conversations that are currently happening uh, with regard to the well standard and wellness becoming very prominent in the conversation of space making mm -hmm. and yet gaining a better understanding of how important lighting and good lighting is for your psyche, which again is something that I had been first kind of really put to with my nose down in Sweden by living with the light and living with the absence of light. Um, it's, there are huge opportunities on improving environments by becoming more aware and um, gaining a better understanding of how to really control qualitative lighting, not just solving a problem, but actually really adding a value, which is hopefully the main, the main goal to, <laughs> to yeah. go to is with making good environments rather than just um, development. That's a really good point. So um, I'm going to cut it there just to make sure that we um, have some questions from, from some people. Does anybody have any questions? 
Uh, you have a question from Francesca Bastianini. Mm -hmm. um, it says, Claudia, you spoke about transitioning to online inst instruction with students. What do you think is most key for students to know about lighting when they are learning about it remotely? or for non-lighting designers just being introduced to light? Oh man, great question, of course, Francesca. I need of to course, from Francesca, <laughs> who's, by the way, um, going to be um, our next, um, in our next speaker series. Um, well, I guess what made it really difficult for us, and I should say our class is not specific to lighting design, but it is uh, for architecture and engineering students um, to, to really make them understand all the facets that light embodies, like from its scientific, art, cultural relationships and how it informs us on a daily basis, all the way to electric lighting and application. And, um, it also should embody an aspect of collaboration. So unfortunately, we transitioned into the online and virtual um, learning exactly at the time when we wanted to expose the students to electrical lighting, which you really have a hard time to simulate. You kind of, there is nothing that compares seeing light with your own eyes and getting your own evaluation with it, being exposed to light and then starting to understand of what you feel good with and what you have issues with or what you relate with out of different reasons. Um, I say culturally it's important because what might feel very harsh as light to me as Central European might be the perfect memory that the Northern Italian person has because the trattoria and the emotion that they have with those memories are extremely brightly lit. And it might be absolutely unthinkable for the Scandinavian to be exposed to that very white light. So we all have our very personal references and there is no right or wrong answer. And so I think one of the important aspects to still be able to trigger with, with the students in conversation remotely are a lot of aspects that have to do with framing the question, being critical, uh, learning how to collaborate or finding ways of collaboration, finding a language, how to communicate by still always um, reminding them, always make sure you see a sample, you mock things up in real time even if you simulate things in 3D, they might help you on your path. They might help you to, to um, confirm some base assumptions that you have, which is super helpful in, in the process of uh, designing. But nothing compares to having a sample in hand and knowing how to deal with it, which is also important for the installation process and the contractor and everyone else. So there are other aspects to that independent from the quality. So I don't know if that answered your question, Francesca, but I, um, I'd be interested to hear how you are dealing with this because you're also teaching us. Um, thank you for, for answering that. I think that that's something that we're struggling with as well in, in teaching and it's, it's helpful to hear from other educators and I think it's, it's true. There's a, a part where collaboration is key. And so collaboration through any method, as you described, is, is an important part of it. But it's also how do we get back to that, uh, that experiential part with students as they're learning. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask another question from Taylor Garcia Dixon. Um, Claudia, what are you interested in exploring in your practice as you move forward in your career? What are you more excited about? It's a great question and I should say that we've had the opportunity or our body of work is very much geared toward high-end residential and we have the opportunity and working on incredible projects with uh, incredible architects and talents. Um, what, what's really exciting for us, uh, especially last year has been we were more invited to work um, on small commercial projects or kind of civic projects 
and um, that included a plaza uh, lighting in a historic, uh, very significant historic part of Tucson downtown. And to work on, on these projects as long as they take and as, um, as long as these processes take to get things approved and, and get them through the different um, parties involved, making sure that everyone's on board, it's really excited to see lighting lived in by a, by a larger public. And it's also very rewarding to see um, our clients really live in the designs and the houses that we have the chance to work in. But to see it on a, on a civic scale is just really something, something different altogether. And it's, that's a very interesting opportunity. And I, I hope that we, we will have chance to go more towards that. And maybe also if time and um, flow of work would allow to also engage a little bit in some um, art projects that do happen on a civic scale that would be really exciting because it's bonding for the team and it would allow us to forgo a concept and to play a little so that would be really fun but that's always also a question of um, workflow and uh, time constraints or commitments that we have and so yeah that's we usually are very committed to whatever is in front of us and really give everything we have. But I'm just like, if there was a little bit of a dreaming and a little bit of swing on the side, that might be, that might be really exciting to go exploring a little bit, become more conceptual and explorative. He said, thank you, I love that answer. <laughs> um, Can I ask a question? Of course. Who's that? Uh, Aaron Bass. Hey, Claudia. Hey, Aaron. Hey. Um, when, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. It's, it's great. It's a great discussion. It's, uh, I always love hearing you talk. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. Um, when you talk about history and uh, you start to, you know, kind of go back, do you, is, is history more in the poetic sense or is it technical or is it is it this kind of amalgamation of the the con you know the conversation of both that really come together and and kind of create the the lighting you know conceptual notions that you put forward for each project well um well, uh, so you mean about history of lighting as it had evolved or you mean history of built environment and how lighting interacts with it yes all of those things all i would think it, yeah i mean it's a, it's a big question but i mean history mm -hmm. i mean or i'm sure it varies from project to project because it always seems like you approach it you know almost as in I mean I, the way that I've seen you practice in the past you know the very small kind of piece that I saw was um your approach is very you know has an architectural kind of thoughtfulness and depth and everything to it so I was just curious on how history really plays that portion um hmm. well thank you uh the we try to approach the question holistically so um, we don't isolate lighting out of its context. The context really is defining everything. I mean, the context meaning not just the environment, but also what is it meant to be used for? Who is it for? What are the preferences? I mean, it's really all these parameters that make up the context. Um, to think about lighting holistically is also one of these aspects that brings the balance of electrical lighting to balanced daylighting, because the one really doesn't quite work without the other. Um, you need to know building orientation, you need to know environment, you need to know even airflow because it will allow you to understand, or precipitation, it will allow you to understand what technical devices you can use, what what lighting strategies you can apply without them to break 
pretty much immediately. So all these aspects inform the strategies that we will put forth, but then it's always for the end users. So having said that, that hasn't really answered your question about history. So history, I find is a really interesting one when it comes to the larger context. So let's say I have studied in Graz. Graz is this incredible historic um, organically grown city that has really great quality of life. Um, it has a lot of buildings from the Baroque era. It's actually the, one of the most co cohesive Baroque cores after the World War in Austria, which makes it a really beautiful place to just walk through. And then what's exciting in Graz is, is that history is not faked when it comes to new architecture or to architecture that is expanding on the existing. It's not faked, it's not made, made look like historic. It is from this day and age, is from this time with this building technology and all of today's understanding that is in juxtaposition to the historic and with it, um, it makes both even more prominent because it strengthens each other's weight. And so how does that relate to lighting? Um, what I find really interesting is when you take a historic structure and depending on if it is appropriate or not, either understand what was the lighting of that day and age and how would it resonate and perform today and how should it maybe be, be considered more from an interior perspective so that it doesn't feel alien or to actually take that same position. You add the lighting from today's day and age in juxtaposition and because it is very technical, maybe very slender and thin and non or I shouldn't say nondescript, but just very thin and highly performative, it has its presence of today in juxtaposition with the historic and it still works beautifully because they can live in juxtaposition or with each other and strength, strengthen each other. Does that answer your question? I'm not. I'm not sure you asked that, but I mean, maybe. No, I, I think I think it, uh, it 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 points in the direction that I was that I was curious about. So, yeah, uh, thank you. But you know, I mean, in some cases, it might be appropriate to understand that at some point in time, you had a dining room that was really narrow, and it had these beautiful mirror elements on the wall that had a candle in front of it, and that flicker of the candle bouncing off that mirror, and that reflectivity created the ambience in the room. So it might still be appropriate to consider light sources that can perhaps create a similar ambience without trying to simulate something that they are not. It reminds me of the, the Amangiri flame that Rick was talking about exactly and where the gas made a certain color and it had that value to it that really spoke of the light. That's, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Um, Claudia, again, thank you so much for your time. I know that you're so incredibly busy and um, it means a lot, I think, to all of us here. Um, it was a strong group. Um, some great questions. So, um, yeah, we're very grateful for you um, to, you know, take a little bit of your time. I think you had amazing points. I'm really going to be thinking a lot about that, you know, the memories and the lighting and some preferences based on memories, which has so much to do with, you know, also other things, aspects, um, you know, which, which in a way brings us back to what molds you and what makes you you. So, um, and so much of that aspect of lighting design in general, how basically it just affects us in so many, much many more ways than we all still know to this day. So um, I am very grateful for your time always. So um, thank you. And I hope everybody has a great day and that everybody stays safe. And if you guys have any questions that just pop by later, um, you know, you can always send us an email um, and I'm, I'll, I'll 
I'm sure Claudia will be happy to answer it later, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for listening in and thank you, Clarissa, for initiating this with uh, TPL Lighting. Um, maybe everyone, every one of you, you should really look up this amazing project that Cl Clarissa is the director of, uh, the Adlib project, which is part of the name of the series too, which is a historic building in Toronto and it is a new, um, perhaps a bit more decorative, but definitely performative lighting experience yeah. um, in a really new way. So it's a beautiful project. We had the chance to visit a while back, virtually, I should say, <laughs> in person. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. And thank you for, you know, um, inspiring people that are here. The, the whole point of this conversation is to just do that, to you know, inspire each other and, and hopefully some, some of, you know, some of us might, might hit a, a note, you know, spark something in our brains that might, you know, inspire us for something more, help us just move forward, especially nowadays that we're all just so stuck in computers and, and we're getting so many things that just are like, you know, sales, sales, sales as well. So I think being inspired and, and learning from each other and, and lifting each other up is basically the, the main purpose of the Adelaide project. And um, so you've been an amazing part of this and we're very happy that you were our first one. And again, thank you. I'll let you go with this last slide. With this, maybe I'd send you off. Um, it was really great talking to you and everyone and have a wonderful day. Claudia, thank you. Bye. Bye.